What a powerful thing. The invitation to be born from above is not an invitation for celebrities to test drive a new market audience. God has not called you because you simply want to build up your self-esteem. You want some new motivational uh, inspiration. That is not why God calls you out of darkness. That is not why God calls you out of death. Your death and your darkness was a real place. Was a real place. And God pulls you out of that. It is not for anything that is like an infomercial. The Holy Spirit is more than just a power. He's a person. The question is not, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? Your question and my question should be, how can the Holy Spirit get more of me? How can the Holy Spirit get more of me? R. A. Toki, uh, Tori, I did it again, writes in 1910, he writes, the conception of the Holy Spirit as a divine influence or power that we are somehow to get hold in, of and use leads to self exhortation self-sufficiency. One who still thinks of the Holy Spirit and who at the same time imagine that he has received the Holy Spirit would, will almost always be full of spiritual pride and stood about as if he belonged to some superior order of Christians. One frequently hears such a person say, I'm a Holy Ghost man or I'm a Holy Ghost woman. But if we want to grasp a thought that the Holy Spirit is a divine person of infinite, infinite majesty and glory and holiness and power who in marvelous condescension has come into our hearts to make his abode there and take possession of our lives and make use of them and it would put us it would put us in the dust and keep us in the dust I can think of no thought more humbling and more overwhelming than the thought of a person of divine majesty and glory dwells in my heart and is ready to use even me. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, He humbles you. And that's a good thing, because that's how the power gets through. And it's not a false humility. And it's not a merchandise humility. It's a humility that you could only experience personally in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Himself, in John 2.23, for instance, attached little value to the faith that rest of miracles alone. It was more than just external. It was more than just cosmetics. It was a real work and a real repentance that God calls us to. Here we have upcoming the spirit-led single-mindedness in the midst of suffering and surprise. An Ethiopian eunuch asks Philip, Please tell me. Please tell me. You see, the apostles, they were on their way. It says here, on their way, continuing to witness and spread God's message of salvation. Preaching in every Samaritan town, they passed through on their way to Jerusalem. They were Holy Spirit hooked now. They were hooked. They couldn't get enough of touching Samaritans. And lame. <laughs> And invited them to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were hooked on the full gospel. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, would move you and lead you out of your natural environment. Don't get me wrong. You got skills. You got things in your life that God could use, definitely. Definitely. But do not be surprised when God starts leading you out of your comfort zone and out of your zones of expertise to let you know that it is His work. It says here in Thessalonians, it mentions that in this region, the church of God was born in a time of persecution. What was meant to destroy the followers of Christ only made it more explode even more. Here we have an Ethiopian on his way to Jerusalem, a God-fearing Gentile. He was employed as an official, as a court official. 
He was a Gentile that according to Old Testament laws was excluded from certain religious privileges. Yet later on in Isaiah, it says, and it foreshadows, that the removal of his ban, the removal of his restriction, that these people would get the full privilege of serving God publicly. And here he is reading out loud a copy of Isaiah, an expensive copy, a hard to, to buy copy. Nevertheless, he's reading it out loud, probably reading it out loud like a beginner would read, probably reading out loud so that the, the chariot driver won't fall asleep. No, <laughs> or, or yes, so excited. He's reading something. And he's reading this passage of Scripture. He's reading, He is led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from this earth. Jesus himself took time to explain to the disciples what would happen to him, that he would ter be turned over to Gentiles. In Luke, it talks about that. He explains that he was going to get killed. He was going to be spit upon. He was going to be mocked, insulted. He was going to be killed, but on the third day, he would rise. And the scriptures there in Luke says that the disciples did not understand anything of this. They did not know what he was talking about. Mark also talks about another time where Jesus is explaining these things to them. And uh, also talk about how he would be killed and raised again. And Peter himself took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus to correct him. The passion. When we hear the word the passion in Christianity, it's talking about the suffering. The word passion in, in Christian history and terminology is suffer. And it talks about the suffering of Jesus Christ, his coming to Jerusalem to be, to be executed by crucifixion. It was very central and important part of our Christian faith. This prophecy was difficult to understand. Even ancient translators of the Bible had a hard time translating it because they struggled. How would they translate this? It was a very difficult passage. But guess what? Philip had no difficulty, nor did he hesitate to talk about the suffering servant. The Ethiopian wanted to know about the suffering servant. This Ethiopian high-level servant official wanted to know about the suffering servant. And Philip did not hesitate. Because even if Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah himself, might have not known what he was prophesying about, Philip knew because it had come true. Yes. And as historically, it is true, as historically is that Jesus died uh, undeserved death. It is, his, it is true that all nations can experience forgiveness and redemption, just as the prophet foretold. Philip's words fell with fire into the heart of this Ethiopian servant and found, and it blew into joy. And somehow, maybe during the conversation explaining how Christ himself was the suffering servant to die for our sins. The Ethiopian heard about water baptism. And right in the desert, right there in the desert, I don't know how you come across water in the desert, but there it was. He says, hey, can you baptize me? <laughs> and he gets baptized. And the Holy Spirit takes Philip away so he could preach somewhere else. Did the Ethiopian freak out? Did he freak out saying, hey, where did this guy go? No, he was so full of joy. It says here that the man was rejoicing. He was rejoicing. He was single-minded now. He understood what was the mysterious surprise. He was full gospel, understanding that Christ died for our sins, and he rose from the dead, but he had to die, not because he was a nice guy, not because he was a weak guy, not because he was an idealist, but he came purposely to die to remove what separated us from God. It was a full gospel experience. Keep focus-minded. Don't let things distract you. Stay in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you out of your comfort zone, and he will make 
those places of hell comfortable for you. Watch those gates of hell be torn down. Watch the Jurassic Park. Holy Ghost, tear those gates down. Watch souls get saved. Watch your life be transformed. Be part of the New Testament church. God bless you.